Welcome to the third day of the fifth X Dance Festival. My name is Silva Laukkonen and I am the board president of uh, Danceability Finland and Gaos Company. And I will be hosting this panel uh, titled Moving Beyond Tokenism. I'm going to just uh, pass it through here, the panelists, to introduce yourself. And I have asked them to tell something surprising about themselves. Or if that's too much, you can also share a tip. Oh, I, well, I just introduced, oh, I can share a tip. Um, when you get, go to your mailbox and you get your mail, uh, always touch each piece of mail only once. You take care of it and, you know, you don't set it down and fiddle or you just touch it once and finish with it. Okay. Um, I'm Adam Benjamin. Um, a surprising thing about myself was uh, a horse once saved my life. Horse? A horse. That's surprising. I think that's surprising. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my, name, my name is Maylis. I'm a white woman in her 30s. Uh, I am wearing a super picky bright um, sweater and light blue jeans today and uh, dark shoes. I'm wearing glasses. I have long, wavy, curly, weird, dry hair. <laughs> um, I'm having, I'm using my hands a lot when I talk. Um, something very weird about me, uh, apparently, when I was four years old, I wanted to be um, a lifeguard, like Pamela Anderson from Baywatch. Um, so, I don't know, um, and when people ask me why, um, I was like, oh, she's so brave, like, she's saving people from drowning, and especially big people, big guys. And I thought it was quite powerful. And later in my life, I became a psychologist. <laughs> Saving people from drowning. Interesting. <laughs> um, that's a specific fact about me. Joseph. I'm Joseph. Thank you for introducing <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm Tabandike Joseph. I'm from Uganda. That's in East Africa. And um, I'm a black male. And um, I have dreadlocks, black in color, and I have a beard. Uh, yeah, I also use my hands when I'm speaking. Ah, yes, when you introduced me, I was trying to think, do I really have anything interesting about me? I don't think I do. I'm trying to think as I'm speaking. But it's, <laughs> it's Libya. This is the only question we have. <laughs> I think... Oh God! <laughs> you're an you're an yes, you're thank you. I don't know. Yes. You have a chicken farm. <laughs> I don't think that's interesting. No. I was. It is. I was <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. It is. I was an athlete before mm. I, I. I did not start with dance. I started as an athlete. And yeah, with gold medals. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Ada. <laughs> that was a scary story. The chicken farm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi everyone, my name is Naomi. Mm, everyone said their gender and such, but I feel like I'm still on this continuous journey of developing who I am and what am I to do on this world. An interesting fact, I think this was also the most difficult question for me, but maybe I would just like to go and say uh, when I was a kid I used to admire my cousin's freckles and then, so I, I have freckles these days, so I like to believe that it was from all of those hopes that I had as a kid that one day I would have them, and he had them. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Thank you! Nice! Okay, I, um, so one of the things Sally has taught me to always look for the actual definition of words when we've been like doing strategic planning or <coughs> Uh, trying to come up with mission statements or all these things that you have to do. Uh, she's always looking 
for definitions for words. So I want to start by reading two different definitions of tokenism. One is from Oxford and it goes like this. The practice of making only a perfunctory, is that how you say that word? Perfunctory. Okay. Perfunctory or symbolic effort to do a particular thing, especially by recruiting a small number of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of sexual or racial equality within a workforce. And the Cambridge definition of tokenism is this. Something that a person or organization does that seems to support or help a group of people who are treated unfairly in society, such as giving a member of that group an important or public position, but which is not meant to make changes that would help that group of people in a lasting way. I found them two quite different and interesting definitions for this. And I wanted to just open, uh, like what does this, uh, how does these definitions resonate with you all? Well, my, what I kind of caught up was the symbolic uh, actions uh, that you mentioned on the first definition. And as I've been working throughout my <coughs> past five years, a lot of with content, media, <coughs> content creation overall, uh, seems like a lot of the movements within the past few years have been for the sake of appearing relevant or appearing uh, as you are on the side of equality. But then oftentimes, even when we now talk about tokenism, we kind of get stuck defining the words, which is important. But at the end of the day, do we also understand what are the different things that are holding these different systems and beliefs uh, still relevant to this day? So, yeah, how to move beyond just the being relevant to actually empowering people. What about you, Dick? Well, um, I think it's a, yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's all about the, the systemic change and the last part of, of, the, of the sentence. I think it's the one you... But which is not meant to make changes that would help that group of people in a lasting exactly. way. Exactly. Yeah. And that last part is actually the most important part and, and 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 yes we can talk about how tokenism is all about appearances and and symbols and like check you know i check this box I check this box but how do you a actually change the system and and is it really easy to change it also the i <laughs> question that how is it like how do you change it and what, what do you have to do to actually change the system on, on, the, lo on the longer term? And do you have to start by do something very symbolic at the beginning? Maybe. Mm. Mm. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, the word token, because in the UK we use tokens um, instead of coins sometimes to put in, you put a token in a slot and it opens the door. Um, and I think it's, it's, oh. it's that thing about whether oh. you can use the token to open the door or not. Uh -huh. And I think institutions <coughs> will very often do something that is tokenistic. But it's up to individuals within the institution to go, OK, you've given, given us the token. Now let's see if we can open the door. Right. Um, and I think that then it comes down to, because institutions are so reluctant to change, but individuals within institutions are the people who bring about change. And that's, the, that's, you know, that's where we need each other and we need to support one another in, in those actions, in those places. Otherwise, you're just left with the token. Right. I, think it's I find this really very interesting because because I love I, l I always love to give it on my perspective side of view and I'm trying to figure out because as you say Benjamin like trying to to open the door but when I even try to find 
I'm trying to find a way how to bring this out because on my other side is that we don't even have the organizations to start with. You understand. Right, right. You, you're getting my point. So I'm trying to figure out. I think this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 You just have doors, but no organizations. <laughs> <laughs> so right. have right. to find ways to open them. So that's a great. So talk a little bit about. Do you have any experiences of tokenism yourself? Or what is your uh, personal experience with this well, phenomenon, if that's what we call it? I would say, in the way I've experienced this is um, being being invited at, at certain events, but not really trying to appreciate my work, but just because they do it so that they can cover that spot. In, they organized and this event had to bring someone with a disability, or they needed so and they invite you not because they want to see the beauty of work actually it happened in a way that my work was 50 minutes and they were like it's okay you can charge five minutes it's fine and it was killing the whole picture and at the end they were shouting a lot and i'm like i didn't even do a thing so i've experienced it in such a way that i think We need, we, we need to first work on ourselves, everyone. This is, I, this is how I'm seeing it. We need to first work on our perspective as, as a person, like me as a person. When I do that, then things will start to make sense and I will start to appreciate everyone. I think this will help a lot. Yeah. I, has, has that answered you somehow? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Any personal thinking where you are right now? What was the question, Adam? You were saying yesterday. Where, 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 where are you right now? Yeah. What you know? What's current? What's, what's current? current? That's the word you use. What's yeah. current for you within this context? <coughs> yeah, Adam, go. Open I think. Um, I think it probably came up today in the in the workshop um, in terms of practice. You know that within the within our world, within the world of inclusive practice, um, there are so many iterations or kind of styles of inclusive work. And so you can have a group that's inclusive and you go, that's great, that's great, that's really positive. But then when you kind of begin to peel away the, the good intention, the, the old structures still remain in place. You could say, you know, I, and, and I'm part of that because I'm a white male leading a workshop so uh, you know I'm, I'm you know I'm not separate from this issue um, but the moment that kind of raised it for me in the in the workshop today was the moment where I put my head on the block kind of literally where people got a little bit apprehensive in that moment where uh, G uh, and I encountered G's footplate encountered my head and you know, it was a moment where people were going, whoa, that's just a little bit risky. And my response to that was, not really. I completely trust G. And in that moment of me putting myself in a place of risk with her, I'm undoing all of that uh, pretense. That in that moment, we're equals. We're doing something together which involves both of us meeting each other in the space in real time. And that, that kind of event, I think, is to some extent a little bit rare. Um, that in a lot of inclusive work, what's evident is the care and the, uh -huh. the, the uh -huh. carefulness uh -huh. and all of those things which are good. They're not bad things to care take care but that gritty encounter of people as equals in the space is a lot less common and it it's those moments that go this is our work yes I'm a white guy who's not in a wheelchair 
and yes, you're in a wheelchair, but in this moment we're doing something together which challenges both of us in the same way. And that way we can, we take away that notion of, you know, yeah, yeah, it's very nice, but it's really just tokenism. You know, it's nice of you to include GE in the workshop. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice that she's there. But it's very easy to get to that place. Isn't it nice? You know, no, it's not. No, it's not nice. It's deserved. You're here because you bring who you are to the workshop and, and we meet each other in the workshop. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's amazing to hear that you've had such an encounter. Uh, but I would say in the world that we're living in, it's especially like coming from the Western world, which is really individualistic and capitalistic. Oftentimes these transaction are, transactions are transactional and now <coughs> comparing it to the like organizational side at the same time when we talk about tokenism, I feel like oftentimes it comes down to like how is the work done and why is it being done. Right. And unfortunately at the moment a lot of businesses and organizations are doing it for the sake of okay, like more like diversity and different kind of people equals more money. Or then it's like this service case of like, okay, in our customer base, there's like these people, so we need at least one person into our organization to represent all of these. And in those cases, there's like, we can go about, on about that. But where I'm going to is like the change that needs to happen. There's like uh, this really great uh, framework for systems change, which has three levels. So at the top, we have like these policies, resources, which are easier to see. Like you can see how the law is changing. You can see maybe a bit like where are the resources actually going. And then there are the next level is more about these connections and relationships, which, which can be a bit more visible, but at the same time, some of it is more implicit. And at the bottom are the mental models, which are implicit, which are hard for us even to see. And a lot of you also said that it all starts from within but if there's not change happening through within all of these different levels, all of these structures will snap back at where they have been. So all of these changes would happen in a multiple level for us to actually move towards a more equal world. Yes. Any suggestions? How do we do that? Any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> well, so where can we start <laughs> digging, shoveling? For me, uh, well, I think as I said, there's like the structures and like all of these have to change. Uh, but at the same time, we also have to change our understanding of what it is to be in a relationship with one another, to people, to nature, and at the same time, like the hardest part, I feel like, is just turning inwards. Overall, like the world is so hectic, we're always looking to grow, to do better, gain more, but then in the time zone, like looking at the clock, I don't think it gives us the time to necessarily like actually to sit back and understand ourselves a bit more. Like where are these different biases coming from and what has actually influenced the way I move through the world. Right. Yeah, there was a, you know, you were saying this like understanding the whys. Why, mm. why, why am I here or why is this happening? Miley's and I were actually a little bit talking about that like always like knowing the why, why am I invited, why I'm in this picture, why I'm, uh, and we're talking like what comes then to morals and ethics, and it makes me think because morals and ethics and capitalism don't kind of mesh very well <laughs> together. So I think the work is a lot when you think about it in that way. Sorry. Um, like, we had this conversation, but like I I'm gonna share that, um, I don't know if I'm very naive, or if I don't want to see it, but for now, in my professional career, which is very, er like, it's a short one, <laughs> I've been a professional dancer, choreographer, artist, disabled artist, which is how I identify for six years now, which is not a long time. Uh, I've been dancing for 13 years, which is not a long time, if you look at it. Um, I don't have professional training in dance. I just started dancing when I was 23, and I did a lot of workshops. And um, Adam Benjamin's workshop in 2017 was a pivot point um, in my in my in choosing uh, being a dancer and choreographer for real, like professionally, was kind of a pivoting point for me. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, also, like I have to say that I've never experienced. Um, 
any invitation in, in any festival I've been in with my piece um, as tokenism, never ever. So I don't know if I'm naive, I don't know if I don't see it, but like I was absolutely proud of my work since the very beginning. So when I send my work, when I, when I send my work on an open call for a festival, I believe in my work and if it's getting selected, I believe it's because of my work <laughs> and not because I'm a, I'm a disabled choreographer and, and one of the dancers I'm working with is in a power chair in, in his 50s, which is quite radical. And um, so at the very beginning of, of, of touring the piece, I was like focusing on uh, my artistry, what the piece is about. I didn't want to talk about disability. I didn't want to talk about what we represent as a group. And then we started touring the piece and, uh, and people were like, oh, the piece is amazing, it's great. And I, I started to have conversation with disabled people around me and, and they told me, this is quite radical. I'm like, what is it? Like, what, what is radical? Like, like, you're disabled women, choreographer, you directed two men in their 50s. One of them is in a power chair. He's 53 years old, not trained professionally, and you brought him in the mainstream dance festival. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, I did. You know? And I, I, for me, it was like, it's all about the work, it's all about the work. And then talking to the audience and talking to disabled people, watching the piece and being like, oh, my God, like, disabled people in their 50s, like, in a power chair, earning the space in an outdoor festival. That's quite radical. That's quite powerful. And I was like, okay. And then I started realizing, actually, what I do is radical. What I do is political. And whether I like it or not, we have to talk about these. <laughs> and even if I don't feel tokenism, I am a white woman. I am a white disabled woman in, in her 30s leading a duet that is <laughs> for two men in their 50s and it's actually a, a different power dynamic and 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 we challenge a lot of people um, when we tour and we bring awareness regarding what is what is it like when you invite inclusive dance group like you have to think about not only inviting them and paying them which is the case we're paid for our job but access from transportation to accommodation to dressing rooms to you know all of that and some people never thought about it before inviting us mm. and then they have to and so I'm like okay maybe it's tokenism and I don't know about it and they were like oh yes an inclusive dance piece with you know led by a disabled woman with you know maybe they think about it but they never made, made me feel this way and I and I do think that by doing it and 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 I'm, I'm making a change somehow, um, and I hope, I, I hope I do, I hope I do, I'm not sure I do, but I hope I do. So in that case, like, I had this question, is tokenism never, it, or is, or is tokenism always negative? Like, if that, like, if that, if you are not feeling it, and it's not it, or is it it, you just don't feel it, is it then bad? Like, if you're the only dance company, inclusive dance company in the entire dance, mainstream dance festival, is it then tokenism? Like, I think you, you have to use the leverage of your work that, you know, if you are invited to a festival and your work is well received, as, you know, as, uh, as was Kanduko kind of in the I early nineties, yeah, I was. You actually demanded at festivals at some point to yeah, not yeah. be the only one, and we were we were yeah. invited. We would perform. We would have, you know, fabulous response from the audience. So we would get invited back the next year, yeah. and I would say, no. And they would be like, but but we'll pay you, and I'd say, no, no, it's not that. I'd say, you know, you've just got to have get a disabled toilet in place. You've got to make the changing rooms accessible. Yeah. Oh, and you've got to put us in the main program, not at the back, as some kind of addition. And if you can do all those things, well, yeah, we'd love to come back. Yeah, I But remember. if That's you can't do, do that, too. no. That's what I do too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and at that time, there were, I mean, none of the theatres that we talked to were accessible. Even the 
the, you know, the big theatre venues in London, um, Queen Elizabeth Hall, at that time, which was built, it's so interesting, it was built just after the war. And it had, so we're in London just after the war. You can imagine how many disabled people there were right. in London in at that time. Yeah. This is a 900 seat auditorium and it had two spaces for wheelchairs. So you, you, you're in a really interesting territory here that, you know, you have more disabled people in London probably than any other time in history and a new theatre that's just been built and there are two spaces for people using wheelchairs. So that's <coughs> kind of 1960s. We're going into that theatre in the 1990s and we say to them as well, you know, we won't come back, and, but we've only got two spaces. I said, well, you can take out the front row. Can we? Yes, you can. Take out the whole front row mm -hmm. and we'll come back. And the little by little, those theatres changed. And now, you know, the law has changed. So the, any new theatre has to have that kind of access. Yeah. But, you know, that first offer may be tokenistic. But it's then, it's what you do, how you use the leverage right. of, of getting a, t you know, you have to get the door a little bit open. And then you can start working. And hopefully working, you know, sympathetically with people and saying, yeah, we would love to come back. We would love to do more. We love your theatre. But these are the, you know. So you have to find where you can be powerful, I think, and use the art that you're making to, yeah, to leverage your, you know. So, but it really does, you know, institutions are big, big monsters to, mm -hmm. to take on. And you may get a change in an institution, yeah. but it may be that you go and that institution swings back, or it may be that somebody comes in new at the top, as yeah. you were saying. Yeah. If, you don't, if you don't change the top, yeah. it's really difficult to sustain those changes that you make. So you have to try and make friends with people in high places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's something that I experience too, is like sometimes you build a connection with someone that is at the head of an institution, and then they leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another person take the lead, and you have to do it all over again. Yeah. And it's, and I'm like, oh. yeah. yeah, yeah, And this is exhausting. Yeah. Like it is exhausting. But it, it, but the, but you know, I think those of us that are involved in this struggle, <laughs> this kind of attempt at changing the way things are we keep fighting and some battles you win and some battles you lose but the most important thing is that we continue to support one another and celebrate each other's successes mm. and very you know if we look at where we are now compared to where we were 1990 it's a huge change huge yeah. Right. and yeah there are some places that have moved forward and slipped back mm. there are some places where there's been very little movement but we, you know, we we look. You keep looking to where the, the good work is, and keep celebrating that work. Look at what they're doing over there. You know, look at what these guys are doing over here. You know, and that you try to keep those networks going and keep using your the good stuff that you're doing and sh sharing it with other people that are, you know, doing making the same efforts. Maybe somewhere halfway around the world. Well, this well, is exactly uh, where you come along because um, I look at you and you're, yes, you're like that. I'm, I've been having a lot of <laughs> questions and I think this is where the process a little bit differs because from the other side of the world where I come from, I think I've always been trying to tell the children I work with and everyone that it's always your responsibility to create the need. The need is always there, but now we need to make it even more visible. And why am I saying this? I believe that the more, I'll give an example from your class today. Whoever who has been in this class, in this workshop, has gone back a, a very different person. They already knew that yes, people with disabilities can do something, but they have a very totally different picture after telling this. 
So we've created the need. They know that, oh, when I wield the wheelchair, this is what will happen. So for me, I feel that the more we come close to these organizations, I feel you have one shot. Yes, they've called you in a sympathetic bot, but use that chance to leave a mileage so that like they feel they will need you again, you know? And then I feel like after when they feel like actually your work was really good, now you can put your condition. Yeah. Like, yes, ha 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 ha, you want it? <laughs> I need this, you know? Yes, but because I feel when you just come without, when you don't use that chance, then you won't have that condition, you won't have that that privilege to use those, to put those, your conditions because they won't be listened to. Right. You know, I'll give an example that every time I used to perform in my home country, I always used to get a very huge problem with the, the cases. This is the, the organization that takes control of the city. Like, I, I love to do community and street performances. So you need to inform them and they don't understand what you're doing on the street and people are gathering. Are you trying to, to throw off the government, you know? <laughs> so what I did, I, I, I knew it was very challenging. I was a lot of hard work, but I, I chose to volunteer in that organization for free. You know, I, I left a lot of work. It, it costed me a lot. But, but that time I was there, I, I knew that this is my chance Everyone I met in the corridor, like, this is what I do. <laughs> and for the two months I was there, they were like, can the government create some street things and they invite people with disabilities? And I'm like, you already had to do this, you know? But I, so I feel we have to create the need, you know? It's already there, but we have to create it. The, every person you clo you go next to, use that short time you're having. Find out how how much do, do they know, because these are people who are close to that organization. These are people who are close to the funding we need. This is, you know, you you get my point. So I think we really need to think of the process of our, <coughs> of doing this. <laughs> you're getting my point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as you're saying, like. I hope that there were even more opportunities at the same time for people coming from different margins because like they are rare so I feel like there's even like added pressure at least talking from my own experience of like doing it well and that there's no room for mistake sure. and you're already kind of balancing with this uh, what is it, Huyare syndrome? Oh, okay. Huyare syndrome? Imposter syndrome, ah. there it is, yeah, you're already uh, facing the imposter syndrome and then added the pressure of like, this is the chance, like I have to do really well to get invited back again. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it comes, I think it comes with a lot of pressure of not having the right to make mistakes, not having the right to do a shitty piece. <laughs> I talk about myself. I've been struggling to start another project. Why? Because this one worked really well. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrified of making a new one. And it's shitty, and people are like, who is this person? Like, Bleh. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm terrified now. Mm -hmm. And when I put my work out there, I didn't know it would work, and then it did, and now I have a lot of pressure, because people are like, when is the next piece? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it comes with a lot of pressure, and I agree with you. I have this pressure of being absolutely brilliant in every opportunity I have in the field, because I'm like, if I want to be able to continue and pursue and build new stuff, I have to be good at it, mm. you know? Yeah. It's like, it comes from a lot of internalized ableism and all, you know, mm. living yeah. in this world where disabled people have to be superheroes or poor, poor little things, you know, you don't have, you, you don't have the right to be ordinary. So, yeah, yeah, it comes with a lot of pressure, and I and I hear you. It's very hard sometimes to be like, okay, hmm. 
I have to do it, yes. But yes, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's hard. But I feel it's also our responsibility to break this cycle. Because oh, when you look, when you look at way as back, like these are the same challenges that has been happening all again and mm. again and again and again and again. So I think if we don't change the way we talk to people or we ask for these needs, I think it will continue even to the yeah, sure. to these new generations that are coming. Yeah. So I feel. It's now we have to sacrifice ourselves. <laughs> 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 no, and blood pressure and like yes, <laughs> So, but you know what I mean. So to I change. Agree. And I would like to just add, like I do agree that it's everyone's uh, like uh, what is it? A uh, vast so responsibility. responsibility to kind of change the world and do better. But at the same time, coming from a margin, I would also like to pinpoint that sometimes some people don't necessarily have the mental capacity. So then also, if you already come from a politicized body, mm. that it's not always just your responsibility to change things. Yeah, very mm. right. Very right. I feel like I have to say this. Say it. Bring <laughs> 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 it on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, it's to do with um, leverage, using the yes. work that we make to... to Effect change, and sometimes there are ways of using the work that we make directly as a lever. So not just that you want my work. Um, if you want it, these are the things that I want. But using uh, the the creative material itself to bring about change. So the the thing that I'm going to talk about was the show last night outdoors. Uh, which took place on a, in a public place, which is great. Take, take your dance on the street. Uh, it's on a public uh, monument. Yeah. yeah. Great. <coughs> Wonderful. What's the problem with that monument? Steps. And there's a moment in the performance where... Um, Forgotten his name, though. Georgie, Georgie, and Gadar. Yeah, they kind of go up the steps. Yeah, and it's kind of an awkward moment. <laughs> like, like, you know, we're going to do a bit now up on the steps in the performance, and they kind of get through that awkward bit, and then they carry on with the performance. But this is a public monument. I don't know when it was built, um, and I don't know what it. Mo I don't know what it is about. I don't either. So, but it's it's, <laughs> it's in Helsinki. It's a public monument. The issue is, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't get to it. Now, by yourself. By yourself. So, the performance took place there. The performance could have much more consciously demonstrated that this is an accessible piece of public art. It could have noticed it and done something with it. So there you could have had the same outdoor performance and you could have said to the the mayor of Helsinki by the way do you know that this piece of public art is inaccessible to people in wheelchairs yeah. the, the fact is it's a lovely piece that you could feel yeah. you know it could, it's got lots of sensory materials there mm -hmm. but uh, if you're blind you're going to trip over the stairs and if you're in a wheelchair you can't get there yeah. So for me, that's a missed opportunity in terms of artwork, dance, in the street, that could have changed something. It doesn't mean to say that every piece we make has to have that right. intent, but, but there are moments where you can use your art to change the way people think about the architecture of society. Um, yeah, sorry. No, it's, yeah, missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity. <laughs> but you have to be able to see that your artwork can do this, mm. that, that dance can do this. Yeah. But I yeah. also feel... Mm. Go, go, go. No, but I also feel the more we interact with the society, our communities, these, these groups, and, and I feel there's always that message that comes out unplanned to, to the audience. Uh, for example, uh, this time we were performing, and 
it was a very different thing. We weren't talking about the access of the, st the stage, but one of the children fell off the stage because he was in flight and he broke the nose. But the neck, we didn't even like the show stopped there because the kid was bleeding. And the next time we went there, they had built a ramp to make it more access. But we didn't even talk, but I feel the more we come out from our like hiding places yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we interact, it will be visible. Like for for like a, for example what you just said, it will clearly show that actually this is not accessible, you know. The message will be out there. So we just have to be active. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I hear you. You say you have to be active yeah. and, and in conversation with. But there was a, a building that <coughs> I worked in uh, when I when I first went to work at the university. It was a brand new award-winning building. Built in 2008, and uh, the theatre had these big heavy doors. You couldn't get through them. If you, I mean, if, I, if I'd had a bad day, I couldn't get through them. You know. Trying to get through them in a wheelchair, not possible. You got into the auditorium. To get to the stage, you needed to get into a lift. That made a noise. Mm. Yeah? And it took you like three minutes to get into the lift, to descend, to get to the stage. Mm. This is an award-winning building. Once you're on the stage... And you need, make, you know what it's like before a show. What do you need? Pee break? Pee. <laughs> is there a toilet there? No. <laughs> the toilet is up six, six flights of stairs to get to the toilet and the changing room. This is an award-winning building. So we made a piece uh, for the... Uh, well, the people that ran the building. Yeah. Um, when they came in, they came into the top of the building. We said, oh, sorry, uh, everybody needs to bring a chair because we're going to be showing a film on the stage. So could you all go and get a chair? So we sent everybody up to get a chair. So everybody <laughs> picked up a chair. And then, I, we, then we said, oh, sorry, you've got chairs now. You have to use the chair lift. Yeah. So... <laughs> We have like 20 people all with chair, like coming down this three minute chair lift, like time stands still, you know. And after two people have come down the lift, you know, we say, okay, this isn't going to work, is it? This is not going to work. <laughs> Just leave the chairs. Leave the chair. you know, so that we bring them down and we show them the film. And the film is about uh, a dancer who is trying to get from the changing room to the stage. Yeah. And all sorts of things happen during the show. Mm -hmm. So somebody, somebody uh, uh, w one of my students who's disabled suddenly starts shouting. And he's not got very good, not very easy to understand him. Mm. Um, and so somebody then says, what do you want? You want? He said, I want to go to the toilet. <laughs> so, well, okay, okay. So there's this whole thing happening, like, and the audience don't know whether this is really happening or whether. But the fact is that he's now got to get through and get out and get up, and all of this is taking place in real time. So that the people who are sitting there are going, "Oh my God, this is a completely Nightmare. hopeless building." Yeah. Yeah. So the 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 art, the the performance is the argument. Yeah. And it's the beginning of the, uh, a, a change in the way that the, the university thinks about this award-winning building. Because mm -hmm. I'm saying it's not an award-winning building, not if you're in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And so little by little, there's this shift and change and an acknowledgement that they have to have a theatre that works. Yeah. But it was the artwork the, the performative stuff that we did that changed the attitude because we've got a, an award-winning building what are you talking about mm. yeah they weren't interested in the end they were i think that's a great example of like how our different forms of art can change things because oftentimes if somebody tells you like you have to think this i have to do that it's like word against word and it's like 
who do they think they are? But then when you have different kind of art pieces, uh, it allows people to first there's like this really great I watched this like art something education. It was like what do you see, what do you think, and what do you wonder? Because everyone can say like what do you see, and then go on to like what do you think, and then go on to like what are the different wonders or dreams yeah. or questions that might arise. I love how we have gone from tokenism to accessibility. <laughs> <laughs> but really, in our world, it's not a different. No. It's not a different conversation. No. And I do like, I want to reflect on what you said, Adam, um, regarding inviting these people and make them understand. And I want to go back to this tokenism or maybe like, um, people in power and people who are marginalized. How do you get people in power interested in what you do? Because I struggle with that. Like, I invite people to my show. I send them invitations. They didn't have to pay for the show. They don't come. I have, it's, it's a real thing. Like, people in power, people will give you grants, financial help, residencies. They can open doors for you. These people, they don't come to see the show. Mm. And and how do you, like, we have to make a shift on who's making decision regarding who's getting the, who's getting the grant, who's having the residencies. Who, if you don't bring people from your community, from your audiences, from different backgrounds in the, in the in, at the table, deciding who's going to be the artist in residency, mm. who's going to be... Like, it will never change. It will always be the same artists, the same companies, the mm -hmm. same people. And that's, and that's the real thing. Like, I'm glad these people came to your show. I'm glad you invited them. And they mm -hmm. came and they sat and they watched and they, and they took part of this. But like, how many times did I send emails, invitation, call people? Mm -hmm. They never came to see my performance. I'm like, how, do, how, how will I get to the next level in my own freaking country? I'm invited in Finland to talk about my artistry. <laughs> Nobody knows me in my country. Nobody knows me in my country. I have no invitation from any institution, any choreographic center, nothing. Like, how do you make that shift? How do you actually make people in power interested in works or, or what marginalized people have to say? Like, it's an actual question that I have right now. Like to reflect to your experience, I think it's brilliant, and I think I wish I could have had this type of experience where actual people in power would experience that. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think there's any simple answer to that. Of mm. course. And I think that in the end, you you have to, if you're going to be an artist, if you're going to be a choreographer, in the end, the only thing you do is you make work. You make work, and waiting for funding is an excuse that we can very easily use i haven't got funding i can't make work um i've made work for no money at all um at weekends with people that are interested because they wanted to make work yeah? i've just made i've just said Let's see if we can find a hall somewhere. Yeah, we got for free through a connection. They weren't paid. I wasn't paid. We just made the work. Yeah, like I did for my first piece. Yeah, and if you can just make your work, and then you have something. Yeah, and then you you have to you have to try and sell it. You have to offer it to people people and if need be you, you perform it for free <coughs> we're 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 caught up and you said this you know that we're caught up within a system which is monetarized and uh, if we want to make work you make it I mean a lot of people will not agree with this and say no we have to be paid we have to be paid we have to be valued mm -hmm. and I get that but at the same time if I love music and I want to play music with other musicians, I'm going to make that happen. I'm not going to wait to be paid to make music. 
And I think there's something about, I, I love this stuff, and if I really love it, I'll just find time to do it. So I make something. And once I've made something, then it's about how do I get it seen? We just saw a piece of work on the street. No theatre. Nobody had to hire a stage or technicians. So, and today we're in a world in which you can film things for nothing. Yeah. You know, when we, when we were making work originally, you did a bloody great <laughs> thing, you know, yeah. and then you had to cut it into bits and then you had to stick it back together and, you know, and then it never worked. <laughs> you know, but now everybody's got a camera. Yeah. We're in a place where you can make art. Everybody can make art. So there's that thing of not getting the, m not letting the money get in the way. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to make it. So yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, and I know that a lot of people are not going to agree with that. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it coming. Yeah. The way. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I put it out there. Uh, what I wanted to say, I, I, I hear you about what you're saying, and I think, uh, like you say, this is not uh, something that is going to happen over there. I think it's, it's, it's a gradual process. The uh, reason why I wanted to share is during COVID, uh, my eyes were really open. You know, I, I traveled out in Europe and to perform, to do my speech, talkings, and during COVID, I was not traveling. And no one knows me in my country. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had no work, like I was there. And in, during my group, I asked my question, if they don't open the countries, then, then what? So I realized that I, I've also created a huge gap. Like even my friends who are not in dance, they don't know what I'm doing. So I knew that, no, it's my responsibility now to start like with the people next to me, my neighbors, my community. They need to know. And, and it's not all about dance, dancing and creating performance. I feel we're just so disconnected to the nature, like Adam says, like we, we are part of the nature. The more you give yourself and time to experience the environment, to take time with space, there's so much you can try to understand. So many things will start to make sense. So. With this thinking, I, I made everyone to understand in a simple man's language what I'm trying to do. So you break it down like, oh, I'm trying to have time, I'm meditating. Oh, but why are you moving around? You know, trying to make it for everyone to like it and understand it. I made it to an extent that I have a friend who was like, I love your work that I want it on my wedding. And I'm like, okay, this is now quite challenging <laughs> because my place you want to happen in your wedding, it has lights and all these settings and you want me to be in, in, in people like in front of everyone, in the middle of the chairs and um, they call it, you do your thing. <laughs> we love, yeah. And, but what I'm trying to say is, this is a gradual process. It's, it, we need also to ask ourselves, do people close to us know what we're doing? Because we get... <laughs> no, I feel we need this support from our communities. I, I know we, we don't get it for so many reasons, but we really need this support from our communities. And those are the people that know someone in the government, you know? And to make, to make something very clear, those people in the government or in those high offices, they know you. They know us. I've, I've come to experience this. I go to places in my country and I met ministers and they know me. They've never come to any of my show. They've never funded. They've rejected my, my applications, but they know me. And they're like, ah, oh, you do this, you did this, you did this. I'm like, then why don't you give me the money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, come on. They know, they just, we're just so disconnected to the nature. This takes me back that we neglect what we don't. We, 
we cut off, we, we want to stay aside of anything we don't understand. Mm -hmm. So this is what we've been trained in schools and ever, to stay away of everything we don't want to know. That's why I love kids. That's why I love children. They are so curious. They ask anything. They don't care how it will make you feel, but they will ask. And I think this is the mentality we need in the new generations. Yeah. Naomi, I'm going to ask you to, you have something to say, and then I'm going to okay. want to open it to you all to ask any questions. Yes, please share um, I think uh, we were talking about like the organizations you talked about, the grants, and like how can you do what you want to do without necessarily having the support from these different organizations. And I do understand the point that you were saying, like you just got to do what you want to do. But I think that there's maybe a couple individuals who have the mental resources or resources overall to just go after what they truly want. And that comes down to also understanding when we're changing these, like aiming to change the system, is like where do we allocate the resources? And you can go and you can do your filming and so forth, but how sustainable is that for your own practices at the end of the day? And due the, to that, I'm also excited like to see within Helsinki and within uh, Finland, there are these independent organizations and maybe coll uh, collectives and so that are coming together and trying to create these alternative ways for people to do different things. And that's maybe one way of like to move forward is to find those individuals here and there, either in the organization or close to you, who might be sharing the same values and might help you in a way to move forward. For example, like a resi like I know this residency and they, for example, open their doors for like people in danger. So even having one person that you can be like, I went to that place and I did that, can add into your resume and help you mm -hmm. move forward towards like getting the bigger grants mm -hmm. or other opportunities. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. In the, the, the piece that I'm thinking about that I made for nothing, mm. um, we got the free space because one of the dancers had a connection to the church. Mm. The church let us have the hall for nothing. And then we performed it in the church to mm. that congregation. I'm not saying that it's a, a model for your life, but, it, but every now and then you want to make work. There are no resources be creative. That piece, I, I, I filmed it um, on video um, before it was finished. I had a bit of rehearsal tape. I got a call from some people in Japan saying, have you got any work? We want you to come out and tour. And I said, no, I haven't got anything. And then I went, oh, well, I've got a rehearsal tape. So I, you can tell, I posted the video mm -hmm. a while ago, posted the video to Japan. A week later, I get a fax <laughs> <laughs> saying, we'd like to book the piece. I hadn't even finished it, yeah? but because I'd, we'd gone out there and we'd done something, and I get an invitation to take the piece to Japan. And the, the best bit about that was I went into, I didn't tell the dancers, the two dancers, went into the next rehearsal and I said, um, so I've got a question how are you guys with chopsticks? And they just looked at me and said, well, we're going to use chopsticks in this piece? I said, no, no, but you are going to need them for the Japan tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These were just two dancers, young, not super experienced, yeah, who had said to me, uh, could you come and look at some work? And I, I said, well, what do you mean, look at it or work with you? And they said, we haven't got any money. I said, that's not what I asked you. I said, do you want me to work with you or do you want me to look at the work? Could you work with me? Yeah, all right. I like you. Mm. <laughs> I like what you're trying to do. And that's what we did. We just, weekends. You know? And that led to a Japan tour, to Germany, to, you know, peace happy. Some week, London. And I do agree with you. Like, you have to be, I think there's the saying, like, you've got to invest into yourself before anyone else does. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Yeah. exactly. But you know, I have to, okay, I said only Naomi says, and then you and I are talking about <laughs> <laughs> um, Like, I think in G, uh, and, uh, and G, especially who started, like, working in inclusive dance in Finland, like, a lot of the times she didn't get paid when she started. Like they just make work because they wanted to make work. 
there was no nobody asking, hey, gee, would you come and perform in our piece? After they did, then they did ask. Yeah. Because of that kind of thing, we're sitting here and everybody's getting paid. Mm -hmm. You know, like, but then we talk about systematic change. That was not yesterday that G did that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, like, can That's we also, thing. like, think about what does it mean in 2023 to Still be an artist yeah. and, like, needing to, like, put that amount of, like, free work and, like, eat it's noodles with chopsticks in your empty apartment that is cold. <laughs> I'm painting a gross <laughs> picture. But, you know, like, that's, I think, is the systematic change that I I'm curious about. Like, is that the model for an artist and for a disabled artist that we still want to, like, have? And I know you're saying no. This is not what you're saying. I, I, this is not what you're promoting you're at all. You're still there. And that's the but that's the, that's the sad, sad thing that there. I think we are a little bit still there. For yeah. sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Can I say? Yes, yes. Uh, I've been, like, 20 years in dance field, and I have this year, for example, have gotten any money from anywhere. And I'm thinking that, okay, I was in the winter thinking that should I, like, study something new and just change everything and just forget this. But then I decided that no, that I want to play and I don't need money to play. I somehow feel that there is no like, at least in Finland, I guess in other places in the world, it's even less that there is an able-bodied person, I have a degree, a master's degree in choreography. There is no career that will go like that. that. So if I want to play my work and do my stuff, it has to be so that sometimes I just do it and I separate the money from my like artistic expression. And it's not that it, I would like it to be like that, but somehow sometimes I think that we have to keep them separately, that we don't build our identity, for example, in funding, uh -huh. or our identity yeah. in how other people want us to be there, or, you know, we don't always get support. Mm. And I just want to say to anybody who doesn't know Kati, Kati, actually, if you go and talk to a dance person in Finland, they will know her name. No, mm. I... <laughs> yes, <laughs> they will. <laughs> I know. Let's see many knows. Yes, well, you I are. Like that right, right. I yeah. that I've been like, <laughs> once I got one year grant, and once I got corona. <laughs> <laughs> year, so that's like, in ten years, the, the grants that got myself. Mm. Right. I just wanted to say that I feel the same way that if you want to do something, we just have to accept the reality. Mm. It doesn't mean that we have to like accept that it's all right. We can right. at the same time like do, try to make changes and try to get to know the people in power, <laughs> try to support us as a community. But in the same way, money-wise, there is the reality that we can change the things like this. And if I can say just something, Kati, um, like. Also knowing that not only being artist, but everything you're doing comes with a certain responsibility. You know, it comes with its own rules. It comes with its own making. I also sometimes get the feeling like, what am I doing? I was sharing with Adam yesterday. I asked that, what am I doing? Why did my teacher tell me this? You know, sometimes it frustrates you like you see something simple someone is supposed to do and it's the only doy but then when you talk to people like adam they say no get strong it's it's going to happen again and again and again mm -hmm. then it will you know so yeah <laughs> but it's the ecology like you said in the space that it's not so that everything like maybe this is the capitalistic way that all the things go upwards right and we all have to be like this middle class or upper middle class but it's not maybe the ecology of the world <laughs> there are different times in the Absolutely. i don't know but i know i understand my privilege also that in finland i can get such employment money and i don't have to work like in many different things even though i would not have money so it's I know it's uh, past our time. I'm going to say thank you <laughs> for the panel.